for years now, I've been investigating the biblical account of the Israelites crossing the wilderness during the Exodus to worship God at Mount Sinai. Would it be possible to still find evidence for that mountain today after 3,500 years? The experience on Mount Sinai and the Exodus are monumentally important events in Jewish tradition and history. God brought us out of Egypt with a mighty arm and a strong hand. This is repeated in the, in the story as it is on uh, every Passover by Jews today. This is the very foundation of the biblical narrative. The Lord says, remember, remember, remember. Teach these things to your children. Do not forget, remember. Because this is some of the most amazing, awe-inspiring, foundational, miraculous acts of the Lord throughout the entire scriptures. And so if we believe the entire Bible is true, it really hinges on whether or not the Exodus account is true. But does finding the location of Mount Sinai really matter? If Sinai didn't happen, our faith is in vain. It is grounded in a biblical location. And so our quest is very legitimately to find out where it was located. Many people today declare that these biblical stories are just myths because there's no evidence. So why hasn't any evidence for the Exodus journey been recognized? Maybe it's because we've been looking for evidence in the wrong locations. But how might knowledge of Mount Sinai's location have been lost? One explanation goes back to the Roman conquest of Judea in AD 70 and again in 135 when the temple and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed. More than one and a half million Jews were killed and the rest were banished from the Holy Land. The Jewish people lost many things at that time. Could knowledge of Mount Sinai's location have been forgotten as well? It's assumed that when the temple was destroyed that there were a lot of ancillary records, extra biblical records that were also lost. And perhaps those records carried more detail of the Exodus. In my previous film, I set out to investigate three of the six most popular locations proposed for Mount Sinai. These first three sites were in the Sinai Peninsula, and their proponents take the Egyptian approach, which sees the Exodus on a small scale, including the sea crossing and Mount Sinai being near Egypt. I'm now set to explore the next three mountain candidates, the final Near Egypt site called Har Karkum in the Negev of Israel, and then two sites using the Hebrew approach, which has a large-scale exodus leading to the mountain locations on the distant Arabian Peninsula, Jebel al in the north, and Halal al Beder farther south. But there is a challenge. Some of these candidates are in areas that have been off limits for anyone to conduct an archaeological investigation because of its potential connection to the Bible and the nation of Israel. When Moses fled, he went to Midian. Why haven't scholars looked in Midian in Saudi Arabia? Because they can't. That's why. One of the first interviews of my investigation was with archaeologist Jim Phillips. There are sites in areas where people cannot work that may reflect on the Old Testament. And therefore, we're going to lose them. And we're going to lose them in terms of the information because the political regimes of these particular states in the Near East will not allow uh, research on the topic of the Old Testament. Swedish DNA research scientist, the late Dr. Leonard Moeller, was a long time Exodus explorer and a dear friend of mine who favored the Hebrew approach. It was Moeller who introduced me to the idea of looking for a pattern of evidence that matched the Bible, no matter where it might be found. In science, when we don't understand things, we do experiments and then we look for what we call pattern recognition. With the data we have, does it form a pattern? Is it something we can interpret? And can we come to a correct conclusion? When you go into history and archaeology, you can apply this same method of pattern recognition, looking for specific patterns of evidence that match the descriptions of events mentioned in the Bible. 
It is important to question every premise because one false premise can easily lead to a false conclusion. The Bible reveals its own roadmap for the journey taken by the Israelites. This roadmap highlights five main criteria for the Exodus route after the miraculous sea crossing. This is where you get to join me as a thinker in the investigation. You can use the Mount Sinai scorecard to grade the evidence for each mountain. The resulting pattern on your scorecard will show you what you think of each of the candidates. I'll be sharing my scorecard at the end of the film. Will any of these new candidates have a pattern of evidence that matches the steps of this biblical sequence? The first mountain is Har Karkum, which some pronounce as Har Karkom. In the 1950s, Italian archaeologist Emanuel Anati was one of the first surveyors of Israel's Negev Desert. As a leading expert in ancient rock art, he was surprised by what he discovered. I did not look for Mount Sinai. I didn't even think to put Mount Sinai in my research. I was looking for rock art, and they found this mountain, which was full of rock art, but has also a shrines, cult sites of all sorts, standing pillars and so on. After years of research, Anadi published his findings in his book, The Mountain of God. It was this identification that inspired others to follow, including Deb Hearn, a housewife from Australia and mother of four. A family vacation took her to Israel, where she met Dr. Tally Erickson Guinea, who is the director of archaeology for the Negev region. Tally introduced Deb to Anadi's proposal of Har Karkum as the real location for Mount Sinai. Traveling down the border of Israel and Egypt, my wife Jill and I joined Deb and Tally. The Israeli military escorted us due to the danger of snipers. From there, it was a long, brutal journey as we traveled deep into the barren landscape of the Negev Desert. After several hours, we finally set up camp at the base of the mountain. It's pretty amazing being here at Har Karkum. It really is. You have worked together for, for 20 over years. 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. Mm -hmm. What did that collaboration look like? Debbie's working from far away, and she's working on maps. And she said, oh, well, they just went up here, and they went over this ridge. And I'd say, no, they didn't. Yeah. There's like, there's no way. This is something that's impassable. But if we go over here, we can see where, the, where there's an ancient road going in this direction. And that was what really convinced her. After years of pursuing these questions, Deb decided to go back to school and eventually earned a PhD in biblical geography. Why do you think you were so interested in doing this? Well, everyone, everyone would like to be sure that what they base their life on is a worthwhile and a sensible foundation. I had a crisis of faith like most people do in my mid-30s. I had another one in my mid-40s. And I think maybe it was the emotion of those uh, crises which propelled me to decide whether what I was basing my life on was true, worthwhile, uh, necessary. Look, if the stories of the Bible didn't happen to real people in real time, in real space, then I, for one, and I don't know if there's something wrong with me, but I, for one, don't know why I would bother. Why would you go to church every week? Why would you pray? Why would you look forward to the future if the whole foundation of what you are doing this for is a fiction? The questions Deb was confronting are also being raised by millions of people around the world. Did the events of the Bible really happen? Does God reveal who he is throughout history? And if so, can I trust this God today? My own crisis of faith early in this investigation raised similar questions and is what led to the development of the patterns approach.
As I consider Harkark home as a candidate for Mount Sinai, the first step of the investigation is the journey to the mountain. This journey went through a series of campsites and wildernesses between the miraculous sea crossing and Mount Sinai. Moses described the journey in the book of Exodus, but in Numbers chapter 33, he listed all the campsites. After the miracle of the splitting of the sea, Moses and the people are now led into the desert where there is no food and there is no water and the people are starting to complain and argue, and God has to show his power and his uh, intention through continued miracles. There are three wildernesses encountered on these travels, the wilderness of Shur, the wilderness of Sin, and the wilderness of Sinai at the mountain. Defining the wildernesses of the Exodus journey is key to Deb's proposal. She came all the way from Australia to my hometown of Minneapolis to explain the details. It became apparent to me that the wildernesses were intimately connected with the progress of the site. And I thought, what are these wildernesses? You know, what, why is this site in that wilderness, but this site's in that wilderness? What's changed? Yeah. What's changed? The watershed. I got my cartographer to trace all the watersheds, which are the areas where water runs in this direction on that side of it, and this direction on that side of it. Yeah, so I see one, two, three, four, five, six. Which is a fantastic thing to work out because then you know where the biblical wildernesses are. Their topography, their geography, everything. Each of these is a little ecosystem of its own and therefore it deserves its own name. I think the thing that's been very, I'll use the word clever, yep. is that you've identified a way to make the, the wildernesses have meaning. They totally have meaning when you know that they have borders and they have a hydrology and they have their own ecology. Mm -hmm. That's a really big idea. She showed me a map of her proposed Exodus route that had dots for each of the places named in the journey in groups of three. There are no camps marked in her wilderness of sin. This route has no water sources, no natural water sources. You have to dig for water in the wadis. A wadi is a riverbed channel or ravine that's usually dry. Another important aspect of the journey is the total travel time it took the Israelites from Egypt to Mount Sinai, which was 45 to 60 days, depending on different interpretations of Exodus 19.1. Exodus explorer Ryan Morrow thinks this is a challenge for Har Karkum. Har Karkum suffers from the same problem that all the other mountain candidates in the area of the Sinai Peninsula suffer from which is that it's too close to where the Israelites would have departed. If you look on a map, you can see it's really not that far of a distance away. I had a sequence of campsites and it was my conviction that these were daily stations. So I was looking for water sources on ancient routes that were about a day apart. Mm -hmm. And look, that can vary. That can vary from 15 kilometers to 30 kilometers, but this is a pastoral group, so generally within 20 kilometers. Even traveling at the moderate travel speed of 20 kilometers or 12 miles a day, the Israelites could have reached Har Karkum in about 20 days, not the 45 to 60 days it actually took to reach Mount Sinai. To compensate for this, Deb proposes that the Israelite men were circumcised during the journey and stayed in one place recovering for nearly a month. The next two steps to investigate for Har Karkum are Midian and the backside of the wilderness. Moses stayed in the land of Midian, where he spends 40 years living as a shepherd with the priest of Midian named Jethro. During this 40 year stay in Midian, Moses first came to Mount Sinai. The Bible relates that Moses led Jethro's flock into the back country of the wilderness in search of pasture. And at a burning bush on the slopes of Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, God spoke to Moses, telling him to bring the people of Israel back to this mountain to worship him after leading them out of bondage. This concept of worship is very important to God. He declares that he is the only one to be worshiped. And why shouldn't he be? After all, 
He created everything that exists. And so the ancient prophecy to Abraham was fulfilled in the Exodus to take his descendants out of bondage in Egypt and into freedom, to worship the one true God at Mount Sinai, the same mountain where Moses first met the Lord. So is Har Karkum in the vicinity of the land of Midian and on the backside of the wilderness from Jethro's home. As seen in my last film, most archeologists, tradition, and the Bible place Midian east of the Promised Land in what today is the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia. Archaeologist Yuri Zarns agrees. If you're going to take the Bible at its word that Moses went to Midian, Midian is northwest Saudi Arabia. We've given you all the information. How could have anybody doubt that Midian was northwest Saudi Arabia? This is a problem for Har Karkum because it would be too far for Moses to travel to the backside of the wilderness with Jethro's flock. However, Hearn rejects the traditional location of Midian and places it right next to her proposed mountain. Now it's time to get out your scorecard and assess whether Harkarkum fits the biblical information for the first three steps. In Journey to the Mountain, Deb Hearn believes she has developed a method for identifying the biblical wildernesses of the Exodus route by defining them according to watersheds. For travel speed, since she believes the Israelites traveled up to 12 miles a day, she proposes that they spent several weeks at one encampment to recover from circumcision to fit the travel time to the mountain. For Midian and backside of the wilderness, it seems their fulfillment depends to a large degree on Deb Hearn's novel location for Midian. So how would you score these three steps for Har Karkum? The next step for Har Karkum is the attributes of the mountain. According to the Bible, the mountain needed a plain large enough for the Israelite campsite, and it would need enough water to sustain the people and their flocks and herds for nearly a year-long stay. There was a stream flowing from the mountain, and there was a cave where later in the Bible the prophet Elijah would stay. Does Har Karkum fit these biblical descriptions for Mount Sinai? Much of our perception from Mount Sinai has been influenced by Hollywood director Cecil B. DeMille and his epic film, The Ten Commandments. And Moses led Israel from the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped before the holy mountain. As I was standing there, it felt like Har Karkum was more of a plateau than a mountain rising less than a thousand feet above the campsite area. This doesn't look like the Cecil B. DeMille Mount no, Sinai. No. Well, first of all, what, where we are here is we're in the Western Valley, and this Western Valley is like a encircled secret valley. This is not the best outlook on the mountain. This is like um, a, a secret campground. Do you think this is actually the campsite area? Yes, I do. So how many Israelites do you think there were? Less than 6,000. If each Israelite family of 10 is assigned a 40 by 40 foot space, then a group of 1,000 would occupy a square about the size of three football fields. Applying this grid to the valley at Har Karkum shows that it's large enough to accommodate 6,000 Israelites, or the two to three million Israelites favored by the Hebrew approach. What about water at Har Karkum? The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them, today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Washing their garments would only increase the demand for water with so many people and animals. So is there enough water at Har Karkum and a stream flowing from the mountain, as the Bible reports? Because if you look at this area here, there's not a lot of water and there's not a lot of grazing material for flocks. No, I think that was a miraculous provision. There is a very large aquifer under this plateau here. I think that aquifer was accessed during that year and the water ran. Mm -hmm. And it ran down on the far side of the Sphinx profile. We can see there is a mapal or a waterfall 
uh, ran off the edge and then ran through the wadi all the way north up to Berakakom. But I think that was the miraculous part of it. While they were here, the water ran. Is there a cave at Har Karkum where centuries later the prophet Elijah could have stayed and heard God's still small voice at Mount Sinai? There are a number of caves in the area. I wasn't able to visit them, but reports are that they are small. What is special about Hakakom geographically is that it is the first mountain you come to when you're heading towards Canaan. It's the first sign that you've arrived at the hill country of Judah. However, Exodus explorer Joe Richardson doesn't think the Bible puts Mount Sinai in the Promised Land or on its border. I'm good friends with Deborah, and she would say it's right on the line, you know, but I don't think it is. If you really carefully analyze the four different biblical references to the boundary lines of the Promised Land, Harkar Kum is within the Promised Land. And the Bible is very clear that Moses did not enter the Promised Land, that Mount Sinai is outside of the boundary lines of the biblical Promised Land. However, Deb Hearn disagrees. This is Exodus 23, verse 30. I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the wilderness to the Euphrates River. Okay, now this is a prophecy, a best case scenario, and I don't think that this represents what the borders really were. Instead of using the borders of the promised land given to Moses in Exodus 23, she uses Joshua chapter 15 and the southern limits of Judah to draw the border of the promised land much farther north and above Har Karkum. Now it's time for you to score the physical attributes of Har Karkum. There is a plain large enough to host multitudes of Israelites. However, it has a lack of water resources that would be required for such a large group. Though Deb suggests that God could have miraculously provided water with a raised water table. There is evidence that a stream may have once flowed in the area. It does have a cave near the mountain that might fit the account of Elijah, though it is small. And the fact that this mountain is in or near the promised land has been raised as an objection against this location. The final step for Har Karkum is artifacts. The Bible tells us that at Mount Sinai, Moses built an altar along with 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. There was a large encampment at the base of the mountain where the Israelites stayed for nearly a year. So could there have been physical evidence left behind? There was golden calf worship. And does Har Karkum have any inscriptions or other evidence that would match the Israelite presence at Mount Sinai? Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and put up 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. We found at the foot of the mountain a sort of altar with 12 pillars, and the Bible describes this altar and 12 pillars. I see something over there. Anati came and he saw these 12 stones standing. One of them he had to stand back up. A couple of the end ones had fallen over. And he thought, this is under the foot of the mountain, as it says. Well, these are the 12 stones. Yes. You count six on one side. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, and this is a very typical Bronze Age um, construction where you have a double wall. And then in between, you, you put a couple of filling stones mound of witness yep. to the fact that at this place something very important happened and not only that if you look next to the stones there is this platform which is very typical of the bronze age altars i can not, see it like yeah. an area right there they're not altars as we expect them to be which would sort of come up to about chest height you know and they would be they'd have nice horns or anything these people used field stones. They laid them in a pavement. They probably patted dirt down over them to make some kind of a platform. If this is Har Sinai, then this is the place where Moses first read the Book of the Covenant to the people, and he got an understanding and an agreement from the people that they would obey. Deb took me farther up the mountain 
we were joined by Dr. Heim Berger, a guide at Har Karkum, to see what evidence there was for a large encampment. There's about 40,000 rock inscriptions and there's about 1,300 mm. archaeological yeah. sites. Where like, like this one? Yeah, where he's found some kind of a tumulus or some kind of a dwelling site or a matsiva or a shrine or an altar. It's, it's a huge proliferation. Proponents of Har Karkum believe the large amount of religious rock art there over the course of many centuries demonstrates that it was considered a holy mountain. Okay, I want to show you something we found even some engraving which looks very much like uh, the tablets of the law. And he gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Are we close? Yeah, we reach in. It's the most interesting rock art. Look at that. And if you count the squares. I'll count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the bottom eight are square, and the top two are rounded. Mm -hmm. ten. OK, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. <laughs> Another theory about this shape is it looks like a horned altar, as such as you might find in uh, Tel Dan, where you have an altar of rocks, and on each of the four corners you have this sort of demi-circle of horns. The similarity to known altars causes Dr. Peter Vanderveen to question the connection of this depiction to the tablets of the law. If I look at it closely, I think this is an altar with the horns, which is a very West Semitic type of altar. It has nothing in common with tablets of a covenant. Anadi discovered other images on rocks that he thought might be connected to the Israelites during the Exodus. These include a staff and serpent, what is thought to be the eye of God, sandal prints, and images of figures praying. What, what have people... There is a great challenge for the archaeological finds at Har Karkum. It's that they date to a time most think is many centuries before the Exodus. One of the world's premier biblical geographers is Barry Beitzel. Anati was a veteran of the Negev. He had done work at many different places, and all of a sudden he sees at this place the kind of rock art in the number and kind that he has never seen in his whole life, and imagines that this rock art must be related to a group of people who lived here. And well, who did live here? The only ones I know were the Israelites and so forth. It's a very well-meaning line of evidence. But if Anati is right, then we are all wrong about the date of the Exodus. In order for this to work, the Exodus must have occurred 2100, 2200 BC. Mm -hmm. So far as I know, no one wants to come anywhere near that date. And that's one of the main reasons why that view has never gained traction. While Anadi believes the Exodus happened much earlier in time, Tally and Deb think the dating of the archaeological timeline needs to be drastically revised. Researchers are just simply not willing to, to contemplate the possibility that there's a, that there's a problem with the chronology, that the ancient chronology has to be 100% correct, and there's just no question it. I think we need to free the archaeological eras from the dates that have been attached to them. I would like to just break that all apart, and I would like to identify the people groups with the archaeological eras and basically let the chips fall where they may, so far as the years are concerned. But for now, I think the evidence for the Intermediate Bronze Age being the people of the Exodus, the people group that we're talking about in the Bible, is very strong. If it is not Mount Sinai, such a place is not mentioned in the Bible, and this is almost impossible. The Bible mentioned hundreds of places around, and such a place could not have been ignored. Egyptologist David Roll thinks the Bible does mention Har Karkum, but in relation to the southern border of Judah. 
Now, Haka Kham, I think, is Karka, which is on this border leading to Egypt. So the route goes up to this place called Karka, and the Bible says that it goes around Karka. Now, going around Karka suggests it's actually a mountain, which is exactly what Haka Kham is. The Israelites perhaps passed through there. Perhaps they stayed there for even a very brief time, but I don't think it's the mountain of God. But Anadi remains confident in his discovery. We are, are certain, I would say, more than simply believe that uh, this is the mountain that the Bible refers to as Mount Sinai. Now it's time to score Harkar Kum for the artifacts step. It has evidence of 12 pillars near an altar platform that fits the account of Moses building an altar at Mount Sinai. There's evidence of a large encampment, including tens of thousands of rock inscriptions and over a thousand archeological sites, including a large number of hut circles. There's no evidence specifically connected to golden calf worship. There is rock art showing 10 panels that some connect to the Ten Commandments, though others claim it matches a depiction of a horned altar more closely. However, these artifacts all date to a time many centuries older than even the early date of the Exodus that I investigated in previous films. As with the three previous candidates in Journey to Mount Sinai, Part 1, when I look at this mount, there appears to be aspects of the pattern that fit the biblical account and others that don't. Now it's time to move on to the two mountain candidates in Saudi Arabia, Jabal al and Halal Better. Many believe the mountain is in this region because in Galatians 4.25, the Apostle Paul refers to Mount Sinai in Arabia. However, in the ancient world, there were different definitions for Arabia, some of which included the Sinai Peninsula. So it seems this verse alone does not settle the matter, but there's a key point that may help focus the location of Mount Sinai. Sinai was located beyond Yam Suf. You can find this category on the bottom of the scorecard in the bonus section. Yam Suf was the original name for the sea crossed in the Exodus. In time, it would be written in Bibles as the Red Sea. The Egyptian approach has the sea crossing near the border of Egypt, but the Hebrew approach has it at the distant Gulf of Aqaba. As I had explored in my previous films, the strength of the Hebrew approach's argument is that the Bible directly links Yam Suf with only one body of water, the Gulf of Aqaba. In seven verses, the Bible associates Yam Suf with sites in Canaan and the land of Edom, which are near Aqaba and not 150 miles west near Egypt. Dr. Glenn Fritz is an environmental geographer and author of the Exodus Mysteries. If you ignore the identification of Yom Suf by the biblical geography verses, then you can put the mountain anywhere you want to. If you identify Yom Suf as the Gulf of Aqaba, which the geographical verses do identify, then you have to put the mountain to the east. You don't look back into the Sinai Peninsula. I'll start by investigating the first of these mountains, Halal, better. Part of this investigation led me to England, and this time, Jill and I would bring our daughter and her family to help us film. Here I'm in the cafe with the fam, and we're having coffee with William Wallace. I've realized just how important it is to involve our family in the work so that they can understand for themselves that God is working through history, and he's also working in our daily lives if we receive him. Today, we're headed to one of the oldest universities in England to meet a scientist who has been captivated by the Exodus. Sir Cullen Humphreys is professor of material science at the University of Cambridge and the professor of experimental physics at the Royal Institution in London. He wrote the book, The Miracles of Exodus. Humphreys favors halal better. 
but until very recently, it was extremely difficult to enter Saudi Arabia to investigate this site. You wanted to go to Saudi Arabia, didn't you? I did, that's right, yeah. yes. So how, yes. what happened there? When my book on the Miracles Exodus was published, something like two years after that, I was approached by the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, by the director of a program called Horizon, and, and I said to him, uh, you may have problems getting visas to film in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And he said, the BBC can film anywhere, right? And anyway, he then tried to get a visa, and he told me that uh, Saudi Arabia had come back to him and said it's completely unacceptable to suggest that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. It's politically unacceptable, and so no visa. Why was it unacceptable? I think because uh, to have a mountain which was particularly holy to the Jewish people, they thought there'd be lots of Jewish tourists want to get in, and they just didn't want this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, BBC couldn't film that. Actually, I've heard this from others, too. Right, it's very difficult. So I haven't seen my Mount Sinai. It hasn't been possible. One day, I hope. Yes. Yes. The first step for Halal Better is the journey to the mountain. Humphreys thinks the Israelites crossed shallow marshes that once existed at the north end of Aqaba and then proceeded another 210 air miles southeast, much of the way along standard trade routes to reach the volcanic Halal better. But right out of the gate, a major challenge in the journey to the mountain for any Arabian mountain candidate is the wilderness of Shur. Then Moses made Israel set out from Yamsuf and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Shur was the first wilderness entered immediately after the miraculous sea crossing. So Shur and the sea crossing go together. But almost all Bible maps and encyclopedias put Shur near Egypt, mainly because the sea crossing is thought to be near Egypt. So Shur is used as a trump card to say the crossing and Mount Sinai must be near Egypt and not Arabia. The word Shur in Hebrew means wall. That's curious because to have a wall in a desert is pretty unusual. When the Israelites have crossed the Amsuf, they're standing in the desert called the Desert of Shur. Now what's really interesting is that the word Shur means wall in Hebrew and the border of Egypt is called the Walls of the Ruler. It's a series of fortresses and canals and lakes which prevent anybody from crossing into Egypt. So I think the Desert of Shur is named after the Walls of the Ruler. It can only be here. It can't be over here. In Genesis 25, the end of chapter 25, it says Shur, which is opposite Egypt, on the way to Assyria. So Shur is a region near Egypt. I think it has to be. That's where, that's where it is placed. However, Genesis 25, 18 also gives a clue showing that Shur was much farther east. It says the sons of Ishmael settled in Shur. So where were the sons of Ishmael? Steve Rudd runs the world's largest biblical archaeology website. He is an archaeologist and researcher who wrote the book, Exodus Route Restored. He takes the Hebrew approach and favors a Straits of Turan sea crossing at the southern end of Aqaba. You need to look for Ishmael. And Ishmael is Abraham's son from Hagar. Yes, the Ishmaelites. In the narrative, it goes between the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, the Midianites. So there's a connection between Ishmael and, the, and Midian. Absolutely. It also says that Ishmael settled to the east of his brothers and that he settled at Shur. The key point is that the Bible says Ishmael's descendants lived east of the Promised Land and that they lived in Shur. So this seems to put Shur, like Midian, east of the Promised Land and not right next to Egypt. So how does the Hebrew approach explain Shur's meaning of wall? There's a mountain range between the Dead Sea and the head of the Gulf that's been called Mount Seir. And when you approach these mountains from the west, 
that looks like a wall, and it literally is a wall as far as navigating, and there's only a few passages through that wall. I've actually been through this area at different times, and it is a wall. If this mountain range was the wall, called Shur in Hebrew, then the extension of that along the seacoast of Yam Suf was referred to by Moses as the wilderness of Shur. So it's a very simplistic idea. So if you put the crossing of the Gulf of Africa, then having Shur as walls of uh, mountains fits. That's why I put my Shur um, just after and around, surrounding and around the Gulf of Aqaba. The next aspect for the journey to the mountain step for Halal Better is campsites. After the sea crossing, the first Camp Amara was reached after a three days march without water. The conditions uh, after the Red Sea crossing, they fit the route I suggest remarkably well because my suggested route is that the Israelites crossed on known trade route from Egypt to the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. They turned south, they went down on the eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba. And the Bible records that for the first three days, they had no water. Humphreys notes that historical reports from this trade route say that there is no water to drink on its northern end until after three days or 75 miles when good water is reached at the modern town of Al Bad. And that corresponds precisely with the Bible saying they had no water for three days. And again, the modern explorers report this, that at Elbad, there was plentiful water supply. Now, the first stop was in a place called Mura, And this is where the miracle happens, where the bitter waters are turned to sweet water. Humphreys thinks the same storm that had parted the waters of the Red Sea just a few days before had washed water down the cliffs near El Bad. The water was probably bitter because there are limestone cliffs, and uh, those limestone cliffs were running down into the wells there, and they're probably making the water salty. So God shows Moses a branch, and he says, throw it into the water, and it will sweeten the water. Moses does that, and all of a sudden, the water is drinkable. There's an interesting explanation of how it might have worked physically to turn bitter water sweet at Mara. The main tree and bush you find in those regions is the acacia bush, and the acacia bush makes particularly good charcoal when burned. And the charcoal absorbs salt particularly well into its pores, and indeed, in water treatment processes, even today, we use charcoal to treat the water, to purify it. Moses may have thrown several branches in, more been burnt. This is a really interesting scientific mechanism whereby the salty water could have been purified. Humphreys believes the miracles of Exodus can all be explained by natural scientific processes, which is common for the Egyptian approach. But he also supports an Exodus far from Egypt, which is typical of the Hebrew approach so he has a hybrid approach. So as a scientist, my first approach to miracles is to see if there's a scientific explanation of them. And in fact, this goes right back to an early Christian thinker called St. Augustine of Hippo, who lived in about 400 AD. And he said, miracles are not contrary to nature, they're only contrary to our present understanding of nature. I believe that the standard way God performs miracles is that he's active in our world and he works with the nature he's created to perform these miracles. How do we know they're miracles? And Augustus said, well, by the timing, they're miracles of timing. Humphreys then has the Israelites reaching Halal better through all the campsites listed in Numbers 33. As far as travel speed, it's surprising to see that to reach the distant location of Halal better in 60 days, the overall rate for the Israelites would still only have been around 10 miles a day. In contrast, travel speeds for the Near Egypt Mountains are around four miles a day, or less than two hours walking per day. The next steps for Halal better asks whether it's in the vicinity of Midian and on the backside of the wilderness. 
All historical geographers put Midian on the east of the Gulf of Aqaba and on the east of the Red Sea. Humphreys goes with the standard definition of backside of the wilderness as behind or beyond the wilderness. Why would Moses have gone to the far side of the desert? I think the obvious reason he went was to get them better pasture and get them water. I think that Moses and Jethro were on the west side of Arabia, and they then went to my Mount Sinai on the eastern side. There are lots of wells there, and there's lots of good pasture there. Mm. So the sheep could survive there. And then later on, thousands of Israelites could survive there. It's time to score the first three steps for Halal better. For the journey to the mountain, the Hebrew approach puts Shur along a wall of mountains on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba, up the Araba Valley. Humphrey's route fits the waterless descriptions of Shur and locations along one of the historical travel routes. And the average travel speed is less than 10 miles a day. For Midian, Halal better is within the borders of Midian as defined by most historical geographers. For backside of the wilderness, Cullen Humphreys believes his mountain is in historically good grazing territory with wells and on the far side of a wilderness from Jethro's home. How well do you think these steps match the biblical information? The next step is the attributes of Halal Better. Czech Orientalist Alos Muso was one of the world's leading experts on Arabia early in the 20th century. He also favored the idea that Mount Sinai was in what would be called Saudi Arabia. Before his time, much of Arabia was a blank map for those in the West. But Musa would change that. He recorded his findings in a book, The Northern Hegez. Musa traveled to Mount Better and documented his findings. So Mills, a great explorer, he was convinced that uh, Mount Bedir was Mount Sinai. Is there a plain large enough at Mount Bedir to accommodate the Israelite encampment? Mount Bedir is on the top of a table mountain, which I think is six miles across. So they could have tapped on the top of the Kleber mountain but more likely they camped around the base of it. There's just a lot of space there. But what about water? And what's interesting is Mount Bedir, that's in what's called the Al Jor region of Saudi Arabia. And Al Jor means the watering place. There are lots of wells there. Is there evidence of a stream at Halal Bedir if you look at a satellite image of the top of Mount Bedir, geologists tell me it's a dried up riverbed, and then there's a stream down the side of Mount Bedir. Musel actually said, I've never seen such luxurious vegetation anywhere in Saudi Arabia. The flocks of sheep which the Israelites had could munch away happily. From the time of Musel until today, conditions must have become much drier. What about a cave for the prophet Elijah to lodge in? This lava tube found at the location would provide plenty of shelter. Humphrey suggests there's another key attribute that should be met for a candidate to qualify as Mount Sinai. What really struck me was the characteristics of Mount Sinai described in the Bible match the characteristics of a volcano exactly. The people are standing at the foot of the mountain. There's smoke, there's thunder, there's lightning, it's shaking. God is coming down on Mount Sinai. And Moses comes to the people and says, God wants to give you commandments. What about the burning bush? As a scientist, I got you thinking, didn't it? It got you thinking. Well, that gave me the idea that if, in fact, this bush was underneath a volcanic vent, 
then the bush would effectively keep burning. What happens is, if it's the right sort of wood, and acacia was the right sort of wood, it turns to charcoal. So you have this frame of charcoal, and it keeps burning until the frame collapses, but that can take several hours. Mm -hmm. And there are many volcanic vents in Arabia. Mm. So there's a the fire and the smoke, which is the obvious characteristic of a volcano, mm -hmm. but there's other characteristics as well. So it talks about lightning, and you get this with many volcanoes, and then the whole mountain trembled, the Bible says, and you usually get earthquakes preceding and during volcanoes. Right away, we can say that the Sinai Peninsula can be ruled out because there are no volcanoes in the Sinai Peninsula. Well, where is the closest source of volcanic activity with volcanoes? And the answer is Midian, northwest Saudi Arabia. Exodus explorer Logan Keyswetter questions this naturalistic explanation. The Bible specifically talks about Moses actually going up into the fire and communicating with God there. So how could Moses have ascended a mountain into an active volcanic eruption? It just doesn't make any sense. People say to me, how could Moses have been there when it was erupting? Well, you can because the lava goes down one side of the mountain. This is very clear from the satellite photos. The lava flowing from Mount Bed is down one side of Bedir and then down the Table Mountain. So if you're standing on the other side of Mount Bedir, you are fine. You know, in Hawaii, people go very close to these lava flows, which are localized lava flows, to see them. And I look at biblical miracles, because that's how I think God normally acts. Now, he doesn't always act like this. I do think he sometimes breaks his own rules, but that's another question. But are the events at Mount Sinai one of those times when the Bible is describing a grand, supernatural occurrence? Professor of Old Testament Jason Derushi challenges the volcano explanation. Scripture seems to testify that when God enters into space and time, the natural order becomes disoriented. There's clouds, there's thunder, there's darkness, there's wind. Earthquakes happen when God shows up. There's fire. As I searched the scriptures, I could see how often God is described in these ways and in settings that are clearly not at volcanoes. When God takes Israel out of Egypt, he shows up in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It's a moving glory presence of God, but it's that very cloud that comes to rest on Mount Sinai. And it's that cloud, fire, and glory that comes to rest on the tabernacle on the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. As Israel moved through the wilderness, it was as if Mount Sinai was going with them. This is not a movable volcano. This is the presence of God leading Israel. The final step involves the possibility of artifacts at Mount Better. Is there evidence of 12 pillars and the altar that Moses constructed? According to Musil in 1911, local tradition considered Mount Better a holy mountain. He reported that there was a sacred space near the mountain with 12 stones known as the place of slaughter, where the local tribesmen offered sacrifices. However, I wasn't able to verify these artifacts. There is rock art here depicting bulls, which is common in Saudi Arabia. We know that bulls were connected to pagan worship of the moon god Sin. Humphreys believes the worship of this false god was connected to the Israelites' worship of the golden calf at Mount Sinai. And the curved horns resemble the new moon. And so that's why bulls and calves were sacred to the local population. So for them to worship a golden calf is very appropriate for this to happen at Mount Bedir. 
When scoring the attributes for Halal better, it can be seen that it has a plane large enough for even millions of Israelites to camp. Musa reported rich vegetation in the area, and there's evidence that a stream once flowed down the mountain. There is a large cave where Elijah could have sheltered and stood in the entrance. Additionally, Humphreys believes the conditions described for Mount Sinai in the Bible match an active volcano. However, there are very similar biblical descriptions of God's supernatural presence in other verses that are not volcanoes. If you're impressed with the volcano connection, mark other evidence on your scorecard. In the artifact step, there is an unconfirmed report of a local tribe's sacrificed place with 12 stones. There is no direct evidence connected to the Israelites' campsite or golden calf worship, but there are bold inscriptions that may indicate a similar form of worship. Until more investigation can be done, I can't give this category much credit. But what do you think? There's another test for Mount Sinai that some believe is the most important indicator of its location. It comes from an encampment reached after the Israelites left Mount Sinai and came to the edge of the Promised Land. In the second year and the second month on the twelfth day of the month, the cloud lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai. This camp called Kadesh Barnea was the base from which Moses sent out the 12 spies to scout the land of Canaan. Several sites have been proposed for Kadesh Barnea, but all are somewhat near each other. Moses appears to record the specific distance from Mount Sinai, or Horeb, to Kadesh Barnea. It is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Biblical geographer Barry Beitzel did an extensive study of travel days in ancient times, finding that the term travel day was simply the way to communicate a standard distance that equaled about 20 miles. This would be like someone today saying a destination is an hour drive away. On a highway, this would translate to a distance of about 60 miles. Plotting an arc 11 travel days south from the proposed Kadesh Barnea sites and using this 20 miles a day standard creates zones that pass near three of the main Mount Sinai candidates, with the others being much too near or else too far. Advocates of the other mountains have various explanations to solve this problem, but it seems like a difficult obstacle to overcome. If the Exodus Sea Crossing was at Aqaba, it would leave only one candidate, Jebel Alaws. This mountain was first made prominent in the 1980s by Ron Wyatt and his two sons. Because Wyatt was such a big part of the history of this location, I traveled to Tennessee to see Mary Nell Wyatt Lee, Ron's widow. Ron told me that he had planned to go to Mount Sinai, but he didn't plan to take the boys. And his whole plan was he was going to sneak across the border. The reason being that he had spent five years trying to get into that country, but they simply did not have tourism visas, and he was not a professional archaeologist. He, he wasn't a businessman that could get in there. He just couldn't get in. So after five years, he made a desperate decision? Yes, he made a desperate decision, and they drove and they were asking directions. And they asked one man where the mountain was, and he told him, he said, that's Musa Mountain. The people who live there call that Moses Mountain. The Wyatts were arrested at the mountain and charged with espionage. They would spend 78 days in custody before being released. And their story brought Jebla Law's worldwide attention in 1984. In 1988, Exodus explorers Bob Cornuke and Larry Williams also snuck into the country trying to document evidence for the real location of Mount Sinai. I look at it now and I think, what a crazy thing to do. The desert was just this big 
vast, inhospitable place, and we had to cross it to find this mountain. Had no idea where we were going. I didn't like the whole concept of sneaking in, but Larry kind of said, hey, I've spent a lot of money. We've got Jim Irwin uh, wanting you to go in. We've got a lot of other people wanting you to get in to see if this is the real Mount Sinai. So I sort of felt almost as if my manhood was in question. So I said, all right, I'll go. And we, we went into Saudi Arabia. Then, in the 1990s, Jim and Penny Caldwell began exploring for evidence of the exodus when they lived in Saudi Arabia, where Jim worked in the oil industry. They had taken family vacations all over the Arabian desert with their two children, Lucas and Chelsea. But when they got to Jebel al they didn't realize how different things would be. We hear a truck coming in the distance. This Jeep roared up and three desert policemen jumped out and these guys are waving these AK-47s right in the faces of my children and just screaming, to book, to book, to book, back to to book, get out of here. And you have to understand my viewpoint as a mother, I'm sitting there and I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old with me. Jim and his son were arrested by frontier forces. After being detained for hours, they were released and told never to return. It made us furious in a sense because we knew that they were hiding something. Why are they being so volatile about this specific area? It left us with a very strange feeling, but an enormous determination to get back to that site and video and photograph as much evidence as we could so that people who are degreed in this sort of thing could have a chance to look at it to determine whether it is in fact what we think it is. It was their images taken over the course of eight years that drew me into the Exodus investigation. In 2003, I traveled to Saudi Arabia with the Caldwells, Dr. Leonard Moeller and Dr. Glenn Fritz. And although we had permission from the Saudi embassy, we were not welcome at the mountain. And all my footage was taken. As I returned home, I was extremely discouraged. I'd failed. In fact, I became very ill and ended up in the hospital for several days. In the months that followed, I kept thinking, why was this so difficult? For several years, I entered a desert of fear and uncertainty as the investigation stalled. How could I make a film in such a volatile place? To escape, we bought a camping trailer and on weekends headed to the wilderness of Wisconsin. My evenings were spent in front of the campfire, praying for wisdom and direction. And now looking back, it's amazing to see that God was actually not silent, but in different ways began to answer those prayers. And my journey has finally come around to where it began 20 years ago at Jebel Laws. Is this the mountain where the Israelites came to worship God? I'll begin with the journey to the mountain from the sea crossing. Proponents for Jebel al laws have proposed two main deep water crossing sites on the Gulf of Aqaba, one at Nueva Beach and the other at the Straits of Turan. This brings up a serious challenge from archaeologist Bryant Wood. One of the claims of these sensationalists is that we should uh, find uh, Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. And that has gotten a lot of press and uh, many followers. And of course, we need to study the Bible. What does the Bible say? Because they, that crossing uh, took place early on in the journey to Mount Sinai. Based on the number of campsites, he believes that the majority of the journey to the mountain happened after the sea crossing, not before it. Yet, Jebel Alaz is only 35 miles from the sea. So why can't you just go straight from the sea to this mountain over here? The problem is this ridge of mountainous terrain. It's very difficult to pass through this way unless you take either the northern pass or the southern pass. Yeah, because after being there, I know that. <laughs> yes, the options to go elsewhere were not available. During my 2003 trip in Saudi, our group stood on the shore opposite Nueva Beach. 
We were there to retrace the route the Israelites could have taken from the sea crossing to Jebel Alaz. Glenn Fritz thinks they crossed at Nueva and then journeyed into the interior. It was clear that the wadi was large enough to accommodate a vast number of people traveling up from the sea. This is the narrowest point in the wadi right up in here, and it's a couple hundred yards wide. Mm -hmm. And for 17 miles, they climb uphill to an altitude of about 3,500 feet. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the descent begins. Fritz's route then has the Israelites continuing south following trade routes before taking an ancient narrow pass into the highlands and the backside of Jebel Alaz. Other Exodus explorers are divided on the location of these campsites. Let's look at a few examples. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. They encamped there by the water. Here are several suggested Elam locations from those who favor Nueva Beach as a crossing site. There are reports that some of these sites contain 12 wells and even local traditions connecting them to Moses. Moses records that the Israelites camped twice at Yam Suf, once before the sea crossing and again at Camp 6. With Aqaba, both Yam Suf camps would be on the same body of water, which makes sense since Aqaba is so long. However, this is not true for crossings on the small Egyptian border lakes, which have the two Yam Suf camps on separate bodies of water. Steve Rudd's crossing at the Straits of Turan leads to what he believes is the wilderness of Sin. The journey then proceeds on a similar route to Glen Fritz's to the backside of Jebel Alaz. The Caldwells propose a different route, traveling down the seacoast and then turning up this main travel corridor before taking the northern pass to reach the mountain. Along this journey, they found something they believe is evidence of an amazing miracle that happened at the campsite of Rephidim. I think one of the most incredible discoveries that we made in all of our journeys into this area was this enormous split rock that we found. We were basically lost, and we were trying to get to the backside of Jebel Laws. We could see a monolith that was standing up on a hill over there. It was about a 200-foot climb to get up to the top of that hill, and this thing went up four stories. They camped at Rifidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt only to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord said to Moses, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. If I'm doing archeology, span the first thing I do is go to a place like this. First thing I do, I mean, I'm looking, I'm going, wow, let's go. Anybody in the Bronze Age would be attracted to high places and pillars. So, you know, it's a very attractive place. Let's go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock. Water will come out of it, and the people will drink. The psalmist says, God split the rock in the desert, and water flowed as abundant as the sea, and it streamed down from the rock in rivers. I was standing there in the split, looking down, and the channels that came out went to the right and to the left. So we ended up with four major flow paths. When our group came to this location, even from a distance, I knew this was a special place. There was evidence of ancient activity, including hut circles all around the site. Rephidim was also where the Israelites were attacked by the Amalekites. Moses went to the top of a hill, and whenever his hands were raised, Israel prevailed. But when he grew tired, the Amalekites prevailed. So Aaron and Hur helped Moses keep his hands raised until they had won the victory. 
the Caldwells found numerous sling stones in the area. Were these connected to a great battle? As amazing as the split rock seems, it's not on Glenn Fritz's route. I really was impressed with the, the landmark when I saw it, but we have to fit in eight campsites between the crossing from the sea and the wilderness of Sinai. Mm -hmm. And the location of the rock that you're talking about mm -hmm. is too close to the beginning of the route to be able to squeeze in all of those places. He also believes the erosion was due mainly to wind, not water. There is one thing that I'm absolutely positive of, water, wind, whatever kind of erosion notwithstanding. That one rock is a very unique characteristic of that entire region. What has always hit me more than saying there's water or wind erosion, look at all the water that came from this rock, is when the Bible refers to the rock at Horeb. This was some kind of an ancient landmark that the Bible is speaking of. And in the Psalms, it talks about the Lord cleaving the rocks in the wilderness. The word there for cleave means to divide evenly, as in split right down the middle. It's the strangest rock that I've ever seen, and it's split right down the middle. Opponents have another argument against the distance to this mountain. It's the travel speed required. We read that it was a large number of people. They have animals, flocks, and herds. They have old people. They have children. If you try to get them to Saudi Arabia, they cannot make it in 60 days. Well, in my opinion, the other candidates are actually too close. Some of them actually would require the Israelites to travel as little as three miles a day. Well, the scriptures say that the Israelites left in haste. We know that they had the pillar of cloud, which gave them shade during the day, gave them light at night so they could travel much longer at night and longer during the day. Everything about the Exodus was supernatural. It was miraculous. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. And there was none among his tribes who stumbled. With 45 to 60 days stipulated by the Bible for the journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai, the various routes to Jebel Allah's would result in an average travel speed from about eight and a half to 11 miles a day. This is about half the speed a caravan typically traveled. When scoring the journey to the mountain step for Jebel Allahs, each view chooses a route based on assumed travel distances within the chronological markers given in the Bible. There have been different suggestions for the campsite of Elam, and some of these sites still contain large groups of palms with 12 wells, just as described in the Bible. The Hebrew approach claims that it makes more sense having the second camp of Yom Suf on the same body of water with the same name as the one that was miraculously crossed. The Caldwells identified a distinct landmark of a split rock along with stone circles and sling stones that they believe matches the events at the Rephidim camp. And with a travel speed of eight and a half to 11 miles a day, the Israelites following the pillar of cloud and fire could have reached Jebel Laws in the time the Bible gives for the journey. As with all the mountain candidates, there are other details that could be covered. Even so, these three routes all seem to have aspects that fit the biblical text. During my conversation with Steve Rudd, he shared a significant spiritual connection with the journey to the mountain. There are Jewish literary sources that actually say that, that God came down on the mountain and gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Pentecost. And that's 50 days. Yeah. The entire Exodus is one big messianic prophecy. You know, I'll call my son out of Egypt. It's applied to Christ. 
We've got the crossing of the Red Sea, being baptized into Moses. The serpent on the pole and Jesus in John 3 just said, that was a messianic prophecy of me. The Jews at that time looking forward, it was a mystery, but we Christians looking back, we can see it in the 50 days from Passover to Mount Sinai where it connects the important messianic synchronism with God giving the law of Moses on Pentecost and in Acts chapter two. The church getting the law of Christ on the day of Pentecost through the mouth of Peter. I find this connection between the Old and New Testament fascinating, where the God of the universe comes in fire to meet his people. And in these divine and holy connections, there's worship. The next step is Midian. Based on everything I've seen, Jebel Allahs would either be in or very near the land of Midian. But there's more. It has to do with the town of al Bad. There's a tradition that claims Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro, lived at al Bad. There's another explorer who is drawn to investigate the Exodus events. Dr. Sung Hak Kim from South Korea spent over 20 years in Saudi Arabia as the personal physician to the crown prince of Mecca. Well, once I visited al Bad the uh, governor office, the, he became my friend. And uh, we have tea together and it's very friendly with him. The Saudi official told Dr. Kim that the caves at al Bad were connected to Jethro. It was uh, the small hill, it's a whole completely locked, but the ancient time they dig it out, they made a cave. No one allowed inside, but I entered inside a special letter from the governor. When I go inside, it's really amazing. It's very old house still there. Notice that the Saudi archaeologists are saying this dates back to the second millennium BC. That's the time of the Exodus. And who occupies this area, these caves, according to the Saudis? The Madian tribe, that's the Midianites. And the archaeologists are confirming that this area, which is known locally as the land of Jethro, was in fact occupied by a Midianite tribe. And these caves behind me were part of that habitation of the area. So what this means is that when Moses fled Egypt, like the Bible describes, to Midian, where did he come to? The likeliest spot is right here. Dr. Kim was also surprised by this revelation. OK, you have the Jethro house. What else do you have? He said, from Jethro house, one kilometer out in front of the Jethro house, you can see there is Ain Musa. It means the Moses well is there. Even local people up to now, they call it Lord Moses well. What we have here in the media, in Albad area, everything is available here. The governor himself, he talked like that. The challenge is, there are toponyms or place names matching the biblical events in both Arabia and the Sinai Peninsula. The question then is, are these names being given to these places because of the story of Exodus later? Mm -hmm. The Arabs are very fond of doing that, establishing a name like Ain Musa or Jebel Musa or whatever it is, relating it to the story. There's a well of Moses over here, and there's a well of Moses over exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. So when do these names get attached to these places is the question. We and don't have any evidence before, say, the third or fourth century AD. Some scholars suggest this site was only connected to the Nabataean people. They carved spectacular dwellings and tombs out of rock formations in this region and in Petra. But the Nabataeans lived more than a thousand years after the Midianites. That would be a problem for Jethro of the Bible. Dr. Yuri Zarns was in charge of the archeological survey of Saudi Arabia, allowing him access to the same location. He thinks there's clear evidence for the Midianites at Al-Bad. That's Jethro's well. 
Notice there's a structure around here. I took that picture. You know, I'm just looking at it, and if you want to see that huge uh, hole in the ground is emitting that well associated with Jetro, and you can say, well, the Bedouin are misguided. It's really just Nabataean and Day or something like that. But we have found Med Midianite sherds there. So if you found late Bronze Age sherds, that proves that the area was being occupied and there was a magnet for water there in the late Bronze Age. The next step is backside of the wilderness. Does Jebel Allah's fulfill this criterion? If we look at the geography of the Midian area, immediately behind Midian is a range of rough wilderness mountain terrain. You have to go through that wilderness terrain to get to the highlands. These highland pastures were cooler in the summer and had better grazing for their flocks. There's a strong history of shepherds following that precedent. So why would Moses take Jethro's flocks from Midian all the way around the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba and then down to the southern Sinai Peninsula when there's ample water in Midian. If Moses was taking that kind of journey, he's taking the flock through dry lands that are also contested and belong to other people groups. So why would he do that? There's highland and pasture in Midian, just a couple of days journey from where Moses is staying with Jethro. Now it's time to score the next steps of Midian and the backside of the wilderness. The general consensus is that Midian was east of the Gulf of Aqaba. There are ancient dwelling places at the town of Al-Bad connected to the tribe of Madian with a local tradition of Jethro. And there is an ancient well known as Moses' well. Concerning the backside of the wilderness, Jebel Alas is on the far side of the mountain range from Al-Bad, where the tradition has shepherds traveling seasonally to bring their flocks to the upper highlands for better grazing. This leads to the next step in the pattern for Jebel Allahs, the attributes of the mountain itself. One of the reasons Exodus explorers are drawn to Jebel Allahs is an attribute that comes from outside the Bible, which is even earlier than any Muslim or Christian tradition. Never hear the critical scholars ever mention this is that you have two very early Jewish witnesses. You have Josephus and Philo. Of course, Josephus was about 40 years after Jesus in Jerusalem. Philo was over there in Egypt and Alexandria, different parts of the Jewish world. Josephus said that Mount Sinai was the tallest peak in its region. Now, Jebel el Laws is over 8,000 feet tall, and it's the tallest peak in the Northwest Saudi Arabian region. So when you look at what is the tallest mountain in the land of Midian, it's Jebel al -Aw. So it's the only mountain of all the different candidates out there. It is the only mountain that has this very ancient Jewish tradition that says this is the real Mount Sinai. I think that's a pretty relevant and foundational point. But what about the rabbinic tradition that says Mount Sinai was a relatively low mountain as opposed to a high mountain? This fit the other candidates of Mount Better, Harkar Kom, and Jebel Hashem al-Tarif. Surprisingly, because of a high plateau, the Jebel Allah's range fits this aspect as well. Both ideas are correct. It was a high mountain and it was a low mountain. So from the west, you have very high mountains visibly from both sides of the Gulf looking toward them. But when you're actually on the Hizma, as the rabbinic writings indicate, it appears to be a low mountain. The Jebel Laws range consists of multiple peaks, and it is actually at a mountain called Jebel Makla, four and a half miles from Jebel Laws, where explorers were finding a concentration of evidence. In 2003, I was able to camp at the base of Jebel Makla with the Caldwells, Leonard Moeller and Glenn Fritz. We were granted special permission to be there by the Saudi government. The first attribute on the scorecard is whether there is a plain in front of the mountain large enough for the Israelite camp. At this ridge, there should be a campsite. They could hold at least 1.5 and maybe even 2 million people. And when you are at the place, you can see there's an unlimited space available. There could be millions of people there. So that is not a limiting factor at all. How do you respond to someone who says, well, there's no way that 2 million people uh, could have sustained themselves in the wilderness. As an engineer, 
I would simply say to them, based on what evidence are you making that assertion? Ron Madsen has a background in the aerospace industry. He is currently the head of Koinonia Ministries, formerly headed by Bible teacher Chuck Missler. He takes a Hebrew approach. Well, we're talking about a people and a book written by a God that called everything into existence from nothing. So I think sustaining one, two, three million people in the desert, which the Bible does say God did, there's no reason for me to disbelieve that, but we had a God who literally delivered food to their front doors. Was there enough water in this area to sustain the Israelites? There was a very high demand of water. We had the cattle, we had all the people, and further, it is said that it should wash their clothes. The Caldwells experienced more precipitation at this location due to its elevation. If you can imagine, it is now ice solid pellets ice pellets. Falling, you know, you see the ice building up on the, uh, down here on the dash. On the dash. Yeah. There is also lots of vegetation. But what about evidence of a stream coming down from the mountain at this location? Still today, we can see a kind of waterfall pouring down in a great canyon from the mountain. And we can see on each step of this dried waterfall, ponds of water, even in the middle of summer with very high temperatures. I didn't see anything like this at any of the other mountain candidates. There are multiple seasonal streams, and there's evidence that some of these are not just temporary. Here we can find living animals that require year-round access to water, like frogs. Also a lot of plants that need constant access to water. The next attribute is a cave that fits the account of the prophet Elijah coming to Mount Sinai. High above the plain on the side of the mountain, the Caldwells could see what looked to be a cave. After several failed attempts, Jim finally reached the site. I've uh, climbed up to 5740 in uh, elevation, and it looks like it'd be like a, a shallow cave up here. And I can't tell if it's just loud or natural. It's a substantial cave, it's dark in the back quite an overhang, sticks out about 20 feet. Can you idea what it looks like from the opening of the cave? The Exodus explorers believe this cave seems to fit the Bible's description, which implies a cave of some size that Elijah lodged in and was told to stand at its entrance. Besides these main attributes, the explorers believe there are more that fit the biblical descriptions. In the last few years, Saudi Arabia has become more open to tourism, allowing greater access to these sites. Commentators say it seems as though the mountain is structured in a two-tiered fashion because the Lord calls Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and the 70 elders up the mountain, but then he tells Moses to come all the way up. Sort of like the temple itself, where you have the holy place, but then you also have the holy of holies. And so when you're standing at the base of the mountain, looking up at Elijah's cave, you just see the first peak, but once you get up over that peak, there's a plateau up there. It's roughly the size of a football field, and it's flat. I mean, you could land 10 helicopters up there. The Caldwells often camped in this place because it was just out of sight from the plain below. That's the direction we came from, so I guess that's looking due west. And when I got up there, I looked and I said, this is obviously clearly where Moses and the elders ate the meal, the marriage sealing, covenant sealing meal. And they looked up and the scriptures say they saw God and they ate and drank. The very structure of the mountain itself aligns with what the biblical narrative says. While it fits the account well, I should note that there's no direct evidence that this is the place. The Bible may also point to the location of Mount Sinai in an allegory with a spiritual message. Fritz proposes that for the allegory to work, it must correspond to real geography. 
But there's one more clue for Mount Sinai that's been overlooked. In the book of Galatians, Paul presents an allegory referencing the location of Mount Sinai relative to Jerusalem. Paul states that Mount Sinai in Arabia answereth to Jerusalem, which is above it. In explanation, the Greek word answereth is sestoikio, a word used by Aristotle to mean meridian of longitude. The word for above is ana, which means northward. Paul is telling us that Jerusalem is north of Mount Sinai on the same meridian. Looking at a modern map, we see Jerusalem here at 35 degrees, 15 minutes east longitude. If we follow this same meridian south 150 miles, we come to the most prominent peak of Northwest Arabia. The name of this mountain is Jebel El Laws. The Caldwells noticed an even more specific alignment involving the split rock location just to the west of Jebel El Laws. Tracing a line due north from this location actually passes directly over the east side of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. They question whether this can merely be a coincidence. Another attribute that has impressed many Exodus explorers is the darkened top at Jebel Makla. The Bible says that when God descended on the mountain, his appearance was like a devouring fire in the sight of the people. This has led many to believe that Makla's blackened peak was burned by the presence of God. But is this true? The biblical text clearly says that God shows up in fire. But there's a number of instances in scripture where his fire manifests itself and it doesn't burn up what it is connected to. Think first and foremost, the very first appearance of fire on Mount Sinai, the burning bush. It is blazing and yet not consuming the bush itself. God chooses how he will let his glory be manifest. There's nothing in the text that I'm aware of that points to the need for this glory, this flaming fire to necessarily burn and consume anything. The bottom line is this rock at the top is black, but it's not scorched or burnt. It's volcanic basalt that once formed on the floor of the ocean as well as the marble that's incorporated within it. And if you look at satellite images, you find lots of this black rock all over the place in that region. So it's not actually burnt by fire at all. It's a geological feature. But Ron Matson thinks there are two types of blackened rock in the area, and that the rock at the top of Jebel Makla has a deeper and darker layer than the rock that was created as volcanic basalt. He's having the dating of the rock tested to see if there's a connection to the time of the Exodus. So in the attribute step for Jebel Allahs, we see a plain in front of its sister peak, Jebel Makla, large enough for millions of Israelites to camp in. Even today, there is vegetation and trees supported by groundwater and precipitation. There are several streams flowing from the mountain and there is a cave large enough for someone to stand in its entrance as Elijah was commanded. There are also attributes not on the main list that you can record on the line labeled Other. These include a protected cove partway up the mountain that would fit the elders meeting God at Mount Sinai. This mountain lies due south of the temple in Jerusalem, which may fit Paul's allegory in Galatians. And the darkened top at Jebel Makla that has impressed many Exodus explorers. But what do you think? The next step of the investigation of Jebel Laws is artifacts. Is there evidence of a large encampment matching the Israelite stay at Mount Sinai? In 1985, Ron Wyatt returned to Saudi Arabia legally with Marine salvage engineer David Fasselt. They stumbled upon something that was pretty unique and it were these round constructions that were made out of stone that were 18 foot in diameter, and they were 20 foot deep. Really? If they're all the same depth of the one that they excavated. A clue to what these structures may have been comes from the lay of the land at the base of the mountain. This is a satellite image of the outflow from 
the stream bed on Jebel Makli, joined by the stream from Jebel Haifa to the south. There's an embankment on the east that confines it and an embankment on the west. So this whole area could have been almost like a pond or a exactly. big lake. And there's a small outflow that if that was dammed, mm -hmm. then this whole area here could form a lake or a pond. These round things that were 18 foot in diameter, they had double walls. They found several more of them, and they all had a double wall with, and I can't give you the exact dimensions, except that Ron said it was something like this, and was filled with very small gravel in between it. And Ron believed that these were wells that were put in there. So as the water came down the mountain, you know, the brook that descended out of the mount, as it came down and into that lake, the people could get water out of there, but the animals could also drink out of the water. And you know how animals, when they're drinking, they're getting their feet and their legs all down in there and mm -hmm. drinking in the water. Mm -hmm. And this purified the water in these wells for the people. Wyatt proposed that there was a series of seep wells along the embankment for harvesting and purifying water. But so far, only three have been identified. Now, Ron Wyatt did excavate this one. The Saudis excavated this and there's part of an unexcavated one here. But with the erosion that's occurred in this embankment, it's not unlikely that others could have been in here at earlier times and have just fallen in with erosion. I mean, if you think about it, 17 foot wide areas for watering, that, that's uh, significant for a, a very isolated area and multiple wells. Yes, it seems out of scale. And I think it's a very good hint that maybe we're looking at something unusual happening in this place. I'm really impressed with the scale of these seep wells in such a remote place. But the actions of Ron Wyatt and David Fassel would cause controversy. Some equipment that David Fassel had brought identified a strong gold reading there. So Ron had everyone come over there and start digging. And when they got down there, they found something which caused them to make them leave and put them under house arrest, which was a, a golden object. But the unauthorized digging by Ron Wyatt, along with his claims, have been very polarizing. You know, look at archeology, span to do it professionally, it takes more than a cowboy hat, a fish finder, a pocket camera, and a wild imagination. You can't just do it like that. You know, when, when, when Wyatt came in here, and dug illegally a two meter diameter pit going down about three meters, that's archeological terrorism. You don't do that kind of stuff. This is not how real archeology span is done. Considering the risks involved, I asked Ron Wyatt's daughter, Michelle, and his son, Danny, why Ron wanted to go there so badly. Well, he wanted to prove that the Bible was true because he figured if he could prove that without a doubt with evidence that's out there, then people would accept it so they'll be ready when Jesus comes back. Dad wanted to prove that it wasn't just a story, it was actually factual. Dad didn't want anybody to be lost. Well, I didn't know about the uh, political events of the people that snuck in. I read about their accounts much later on and since their accounts of what they thought was the mountain of God kind of fit with my ideas, I thought that was pretty good. But that just kind of poisoned the well for everyone else to then do scientific work in the area. The government became much more paranoid about letting anyone in to do that work, and they put fences up and keep people away. So uh, that wasn't a very good uh, move on their part. So I'll be honest, the reason I was a critic at the beginning is because the mountain was primarily popularized by uh, folks like Ron Wyatt, who, in my opinion, had made some statements over the years that were uh, dubious at best. And I think there's a lot of others that felt the same way as I did. But despite any claims that Ron Wyatt or you know any of the explorers over the years had made that I may disagree with, I think in terms of the location of Mount Sinai, he nailed it, absolutely nailed it. 
And I should just add this too, Ron didn't discover the mountain, he just popularized it in modern times because the local Muslims have always believed that it's the real Mount Sinai. And interestingly, the reason they believe that is because of this ancient Christian and before that, this very ancient Jewish tradition that says this is the real Mount Sinai. In the end, I think it's important to remember that the case for any mountain candidate should not be based on personalities or the authority of the presenters, but rather on how well the evidence matches all the biblical criteria. Now we move on to the next artifact. In the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us that Moses was instructed to build an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young Israelite men to sacrifice young bulls as offerings to the Lord. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Is there evidence of an altar and 12 pillars? There needs to be an altar of Moses at the foot of that mountain not halfway up, not a great distance from, but at the foot of the mountain, very specific detail. At the base of the mountain, behind the fence that the Saudis have erected, there are a set of ruins. Now these ruins perfectly fit Exodus chapter 24. It talks about some pillars being erected, each one representing one of the tribes, and an altar that Moses would have done sacrifices on. The Bible says this altar constructed for animal sacrifices was to be made of uncut stones. Overall, the length from east to west is about 120 feet. And directly to the north is a stack of about 12 marble pillars that are about 22 inches in diameter and a foot to two feet in height. This is most likely a place where a lot of bulls and sheep were sacrificed led to the place of sacrifice in two long corridors to separate the animals. And in the end of the corridor, they were sacrificed. And that is the reason why we find these very thick layers of ash. Once I realized what this site was, I dropped to my knees and it just sent chills through my body to think it could possibly be this site. In 1995, the Saudis conducted their own investigation of the Jebel Makla area and published their findings in a book called Al Bid. They found material around this structure that dated to the time of the Nabataeans, more than a thousand years after the Exodus. They proposed the structure was a residence for workers cutting marble on the nearby ridge. This is a prime reason for the wide conclusion that this site has no connection to the Israelites. Why have you not been convinced that that is the location of Mount Sinai? I have looked at these different uh, structures that are found there, and I have also looked at the archaeological evidence, and it all suggests that the structures are much later and related to Old Arabian and Nabataean culture. However, Dr. Zarns, as a former director of the Archaeological Survey of Saudi Arabia, questions the thoroughness of the Saudi investigation. From the book that the Saudis produced, it's difficult to say that they fully excavated the area to its fullest extent, let's put it that way. It's pretty easy to say something like this. Well, my boss says, get over there, and, and what the heck is going on about that mountain? Get over there and find out something, and uh, let me know what's going on. So now you're reading between the lines, you know you don't want to find late Bronze Age stuff and verify that. So what you do is you go over there, you find Nabataean stuff and say, that's enough excavation. See, it's Nabataean. I'm just making that as a hypothetical scenario. It's very difficult for some archeologists, male or female, to, to keep one's job, shall we say, in an academic setting uh, by saying that my idea is and I'm gonna search for the Exodus or I'm gonna search for the origins of Judaism. What you really need to do is say, okay, I'm gonna excavate here. The surface material is Nabataean, the stuff underneath it may be bronzy. We don't know how deep that stuff was. They didn't conduct a deep enough excavation. For whatever reason, I don't wanna speculate on that, but you know, it's just difficult to say. 
If it is possible that this structure is much older, the question remains, what was it used for? There's this long stone structure that has a sort of an L shape to it. I don't know if you've seen that. It looks nothing like an altar that I've ever seen. It looks like it's a Nabataean quarry that we're dealing with here, where the workmen would have slept in this bivouac, a sort of place with the low walls which would protect them from the wind and possible creatures like snakes, etc. And they would have had a canopy over the top of it. And at one end of it, there's a narrow gap with some ash on the far side. Well, that's a kitchen. Now, again, the critics will say, well, this is just some type of living structure. That's not like any living structure that I've ever seen. And there's a stream that runs right next to it. And it actually mentions in Deuteronomy that there was a stream that came down the mountain. So really, everything is there. So what was this structure? I headed to Colorado to meet with Temple Grandin, an American scientist and cattle expert. Her life story dealing with autism was told in the feature film Temple Grandin, played by Claire Danes. Her unique insights into animal behavior revolutionized cattle slaughter practices around the world. Down in here, it looks as if, in this area, it looks like there was burning and well, bones. Well, they verified and that type there was burning stuff there? So uh, archaeologists verified? have. They have verified that? Yeah, yes. If this was a livestock facility, the reason you make it this design would be so that the animals entering here don't see the activity here. Mm -hmm. I've actually laid out the single file shoots that had been like that. Sheep and cattle both have a natural behavior to want to go back to where they come from. So this is the reason why I've designed um, cattle handling facilities uh, that are curved to take advantage of that natural tendency to go back to where they come from. What I found curious is that the walls were only about three feet high, and in Exodus 20:24, 20, God mentions offerings of sheep. It's eight foot wide, and if you were handling sheep in groups, mm -hmm. eight foot wide would be what you'd make the corridor. Why, why eight feet? Because I can bring the groups up really easily in that. OK. And bring a bunch up at a time. There's a lot of uh, livestock things that have an eight foot wide uh, yeah. corridor. Yeah. That's common. Now, I want to make it very clear, I'm not saying this is definitely a handling facility. Right, right. I, I don't know. Yeah. And I don't have enough of the other information, but other stuff they found at the site. Yeah. But the curiousness of it for it's us. It's sort of a weird layout. It's like, what else would you use it for? Yeah. I don't know. You tell me that ash, ancient ash, was found at the end of this eight-foot-wide chevron-shaped corridor. Yeah, it's possible they could have used it for sacrifices. What about the 12 pillars at the proposed altar site? These are small marble pillars, and they're lying randomly around the altar structure, which you can see to the right. Some explorers think these marble pillars may have been the 12 pillars erected by Moses, but others note that they have been carved which does not really fit the normal definition of masaba, or standing stones in the days of Moses, which is translated as pillars in this verse. But the thing is, is the pillars would have been valuable. Why were they left there? Well, that's the, the big question. My suspicion is that the pillars that Moses erected were on cut rocks, or a single rock for each tribe. And that goes back to Jacob, when he erected a masabat and anointed it, it was just an unhewn stone. It was a field stone. These marble pillars found near the base of the stone structure were taken from a quarry up the ravine. So is there a connection between this quarry, these pillars, and the story of the Exodus? There's a connection in that I believe it memorialized the Exodus. And I believe in those early centuries AD that the Jews still knew where Mount Sinai was. It probably was designed to be a small open air synagogue. But I don't think it was ever finished because I don't see any signs of any type of solid foundation. That's just a guess. But the incomplete cuttings in the quarry and the disarray uh, structurally at the base of the mountain gives me that idea. If it's not part of the story of the Exodus, then somebody went to a lot of trouble to drag that marble to that site for some other reason. And, and, that, and leave it there. And leave it there. 
The Elbit investigation concluded these marble columns were discarded from the workers of the quarry during the Nabataean period. They didn't speculate about their intended use. I find these carved pillars very intriguing, but although some argue otherwise, I'm not sure they fit the definition of masaba or standing stones like I've seen in Har Karkum, Shechem, and Gezer. That being said, could there be evidence of standing stones in this area below the surface waiting to be found? The second time we went into the site, once we entered the valley, within 15 minutes, the Bedouin were on us. He drew his weapon. His son drew a shotgun. And within minutes, another vehicle pulled up. They had weapons, and we were arrested. They took us one truck in front, one behind my vehicle, through the desert, to a frontier forces outpost. The mother instinct would kick in with me and I would, I would think to myself, what are you doing? Why are you putting your kids through this? You know, people would come to me and say, guns pointed near your children and you're taking them back? Have you lost your mind? I can't explain to you why we feel this is so important that I would risk what we're risking to do this. Oh, you need. Got it. But at the same time, there was such a drive to do this. Sometimes people talk about they feel like they're on a mission from God. Well, you know, you, you laugh at that and you think that's a ludicrous thing. And yet, that's almost what this felt like because when we were going and doing these trips, we were almost fearless. Despite the danger, the Caldwells returned to the mountain 15 times to document the archaeological remains in the area. They were driven, just like so many others from all over the world, to search for the exodus. Maybe we're all searching for things to get us closer to God. This Bible is not just story or history. It is true stories. What I found out, what is written in the Bible, everything is, I can show you. This one is true stories. So that's why what I believe, God is warning to the peoples, listen or not listen, it was true stories. The Exodus is the first time in recorded history where God tells a nation to come and worship Him and Him alone. According to the biblical text, on the third day after their arrival, Moses gathered the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, and God came down in fire and smoke and spoke to the people. The terms of the covenant were presented to the Israelites in 10 commandments. The first of these being that they would have no other gods and make no idols. And the Israelites agreed, but that didn't last very long. Is there evidence for golden calf worship? DeMille's 1923 version of the Ten Commandments was one of the first to portray these events for the cinema. Moses went up to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, where he received written tablets of the Ten Commandments. When the people saw that Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods who shall go before us. So Aaron said to them, take off your rings of gold and bring them to me. He received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, made a golden calf, and they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay, we've come into an area called Jebel Laws. Uh, in this area, we found a fenced off archaeological site. Got some rock carvings. Uh, we can't get into the area, but we can see what we need to see through the fence. I'll get the best views that I can get. We're up on the uh, top area there. You look across the valley and you see this 
big pile of stones that goes up 30 feet, and it's this big monolith that comes out of the sand and has bulls inscribed on the side of it and pictures of bovine all around this altar site. Many of the Exodus explorers believe the worship of the golden calf happened at this pile of boulders because of these depictions of bulls, as well as other bull inscriptions nearby. So the Bible says that the golden calf altar was in front of the actual golden calf. So if the golden calf was up there on the platform, like you would assume, so everyone could see it and worship it, then there should be a separate altar section in front of it. David Roll, however, sees no connection. I personally found thousands of rock carvings of bulls and cattle, huge ones, you know, a meter and a half, two meters wide. It's very, very common in that region. It's got absolutely nothing to do with Moses and the Bronze Age. It's actually the Stone Age we're dealing with. Egyptian culture practiced the worship of many gods, including bulls and cows. A person with raised arms was a common way to portray praise. After centuries of living in Egypt, the Israelites would have been very familiar with these forms of worship. If you look at Egyptian religious iconography, I've got this picture from the tomb of Pharaoh Seti. It's very specific. It's got a picture of a person actually underneath the cow. You've got a person behind the cow holding the tail. Very specific imagery. When you look at some of the murals that are surrounding the, uh, the golden calf altar, you have these exact images. You have a person underneath the cow exactly like what we see in the Valley of the Kings. We see pictures of people holding the tails of the cows. This is Egyptian religious iconography. This is not just farmers or, or hunting scenes or this sort of thing. But Herschel Shanks, the founder of Biblical Archaeology Review, is skeptical of the whole idea. The idea that the, that the altar that, that uh, Aaron built the golden calf on has survived like this and is sitting there <laughs> is wild. These pictures put together a whole jumble of questions. You don't know what period they're from. They haven't been looked at scientifically. Although Glenn Fritz favors Jebel Makla, he does not think the bull images are connected to the worship of the golden calf. I think the most interesting image for me was this one right here. Yes, and I think the main point here is the dating of these items generally far precedes the time of the Exodus. The other thing is that it didn't say that they carved bulls on the rocks, right? Right. The Saudi Albed book states that the inscriptions in the area date from a range between 3000 and 1500 BC. Joe Richardson argues that the end of this range actually puts them right up to the era of the Exodus. The scriptures say that the people ate and drank and they rose up to play. And that's exactly what the petroglyphs portray. He comes down off the mountain and he sees that the people are completely wild. They're completely indulgent. They're, they've lost all sense of right and wrong. The people had made a graven image, a golden calf, and he is deeply disturbed. And he throws the tablets down and they break. Moses then calls to the people and says, who is loyal to God? Come and join me. And the tribe of Levi shows up and he tells them to arm themselves and to kill whoever worshiped or served the idol even if it's your close friend, your relative, your neighbor. And they do, and 3,000 people are killed that day. Joe Richardson took these photos in the campsite area. He wonders if these could be depictions of idol worshipers with their arms raised and pierced by swords, just as described in the Bible. But there was something more nearby. The Caldwells have found a huge area that seems to resemble a graveyard. Big marker right here. I don't see any signs of any petroglyphs at all. Why should one find a graveyard 
thousands of graves in the middle of the wilderness, in a desert. Six feet tall. It's an enormous graveyard. It extends all the way across to the other side of the mountain, and it's literally filled with these standing stone markers. The cemetery itself is very impressive. Me and my colleagues have excavated many cemetery fields. When you get a huge cemetery field with megaliths like this, it's very unique. Why is this here? Why is this 21 football field sized area? Why is it there? Because there have never been large populations living in this area of Jebel Laws. So why would you need a large cemetery? Well, if the exodus occurred in this area, and specifically the golden calf worship, that could explain it. The idea is that if you have to bury 3,000 people all of a sudden, that mass graveyard would not be located where the encampment was. It would be outside of the encampment area. And this graveyard is about four and a half miles up the wadi from the base of Jebel Makla. Just one thing found there matching the biblical narrative is interesting, and two things becomes more interesting. Three becomes almost compelling, but you get four and five and six, and then it becomes overwhelming that something significant has happened here a long time ago. Personally, I believe the Lord has purposefully preserved the real Mount Sinai for this very hour. He's about to say to the whole world, remember the mighty things that I did when I led Israel out of Egypt with a mighty and outstretched hand. When I ripped the ocean in half, when I brought forth water from the rock, all of these things, he's about to remind the world, remember this? I've preserved all of the evidence. It's sitting out there for everyone to see. Time to evaluate the artifact step for Jebel Alaws. There is a narrow 120 foot long structure leading to a low area containing deep layers of ash. The double corridors have been proposed to be chutes for animals being led to an altar. The remains of marble pillars are a bit of a mystery. Are they Masaba? Are they unrelated? Or could they possibly be from a later memorial? An ancient lake has been proposed here with what appears to be at least three seep wells on an embankment. Their very large size fits the idea of a large encampment with a great need for water. Inscriptions of bulls on rocks and worshipers have been connected by some to the worship of the golden calf. Bull images have been found all over Arabia, but some of the ones here appear to have an Egyptian pagan connection, which the Israelites would have been familiar with. There is also a massive cemetery which seems out of place for this remote area, but would fit the 3,000 killed after the Golden Calf incident. Because of questions about dates, we can't say with certainty that any one of the artifacts found here come from the Exodus. But the large amount of evidence is very intriguing and seems to fit the Bible well. But what do you think? If we suspect it to be the mountain of God, we need someone to go there, survey everything, excavate it. Let me find the artifacts. Once I find the artifacts, then I'll tell you what the period is. These photos were taken in May of 2003 near Jebel Alaz. Now, after more than 20 years and six mountain candidates, I've come to my final conclusion as to which mountain has the best pattern of evidence. All the mountains have some interesting evidence. The advocates of each site seem very confident in their proposals, emphasizing one or two aspects as key in their approach. Whether it's traditional Mount Sinai with its toponyms for campsites, Jebel Sinia with its interpretation of Hebrew inscriptions at the nearby mines, Hashem El Tarif with its limited travel speed to a site on the crossroads, or Har Karkum with its sequence of wildernesses based on watersheds. These all have strengths and weaknesses. But there's something unique about the two Arabian mountains. Both are beyond the Gulf of Aqaba, 
which because of my previous investigation, impressed me as being the biblical Yom Suf. When I look at Halal Bedar, this proposal is based on linking Sinai to volcanic activity. But when you combine 11 days to Kadesh Barnea with beyond Yom Suf, then Jebel Alaz is the best fit. It has the overall pattern of geography, historical references, and attributes that impresses me the most. With every film I make, I learn something deeper. In this investigation, it began at the burning bush, where God tells Moses to bring the Israelites back to this mountain to worship him. As unlikely as it may have seemed, these slaves, held by the most powerful empire in the world, were miraculously brought out of bondage by God. And Moses returned to Mount Sinai with all the Israelites, as God had promised, after taking them through the wilderness and a parted sea where their enemies were destroyed. God was faithful, and now they would meet and worship him. It was on the third day at the mountain that the Israelites heard the voice and saw the fire of God and agreed to be his people. They entered into a covenant, a binding agreement with the creator of the universe. God had called them to the mountain to worship. He wanted a people who would worship him alone. At first, I didn't completely understand the significance of this call to worship God. But the Bible tells us that we are created to worship Him. And just as God was faithful to His promise to Moses, He's been faithful in my own life. Yes, I've had times of hardship and failure, times of discouragement, when I've wondered if I could continue. But as I look back on my own life, I see God's hand of guidance and provision. So what have I learned? To really draw near to God, I need to worship Him. In the good times and in the hard times, I need to worship Him and Him alone.